All right, hello Poly 101 students. Thank you for tuning in to this video lecture um, so that we didn't have to meet this week. This week we're going to open up a two-week unit where we discuss the causes of international conflict. So for this unit, we're going to be thinking about a dependent variable, whether or not there is war. So the variable <clears throat> is whether or not we have war and the values that the variable might take are yes or no. We'd like to explain the difference between these outcomes by looking at a variety of independent variables that the different authors are going to discuss. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we're also going to use these readings to reflect a little bit on the, uh, the methods that we've discussed that political scientists use to determine whether an independent variable actually causes a dependent variable. And we're also going to use this opportunity to talk a little bit again about the, uh, the assumptions that social scientists make it turns out that the causes of war literature is a really great time to review these assumptions. The, the theories in the causes of war literature are really straightforward. They tend to be, you know, fit right into one of these boxes. And so it gives us an opportunity to think about how you can use, um, use these assumptions to create theories that are simple and easy to understand how you can use these assumptions to generate some obvious tests of these theories. And then uh, maybe most importantly, how you can understand what assumptions and the author of a theory or the author of a policy, a politician who's telling you what to think about international conflict might be engaging in, and how you might switch up those assumptions in a way that allows you to critique the theory or think more critically about what you're being told about international war. Okay, so just to review really quickly, this is the dimension that tells us what varies. In the first image, elite characteristics vary. This is where we have presidents, dictators, military generals, CEOs of companies, heads of political parties who have particular characteristics. And as those characteristics vary, that's the independent variable, it changes the value of, of the particular dependent variable. The second image refers to characteristics within the organization. Usually by the organization we mean states. So the archetypical variation between units in the state system is whether a country is a democracy or an autocracy. We might also wonder whether a country is rich or poor, whether it is a parliamentary democracy or a presidential democracy, whether a company is publicly or privately owned. The third image refers to characteristics of the system of units. And when we talk about the system of units, usually we're talking about the international community. So we might be asking about whether having a unipolar system where the United States is the only major world power is going to provide different outcomes in terms of conflict than having a bipolar system when the USSR and the United States were in direct competition. Um, but obviously sometimes we can be talking about markets or party systems or or other systems of units. This dimension tells us what motivates the decision maker. This is a lot more straightforward. If the decision maker cares most about the survival of some unit, whether it's their own survival, the survival of the country, the survival of the company, it doesn't really matter. Um, if it's survival, then we refer to this assumption as realism. If we think that the decider is mostly worried about money, that's sort of the school of political economy. And if there's some sort of cultural influence that's motivating the decision maker, then we think about this as political sociology or maybe constructivism. Remember that the decision maker is not always the same entity that varies. You might have presidents who are decision makers who change their decision based upon how democracy works in a country, and that would be second image. So if you have an executive and you think that executives who are presidents might make decisions differently than executives that are prime ministers, as we covered last week, you have a decision maker who is an individual within a system, but they are reacting to variation within the unit at the second image level. They're reacting to the constraints that are placed upon their behaviors by the system of democracy in which they operate or by the system um, of the company's governance in which they operate. Also remember that the decision makers are not always making decisions for themselves. Presidents might attempt to maximize their own wealth. 
or they might attempt to make decisions about policy that maximize wealth for a particular constituency within the country in which they are the president or the entire country. We're, so these assumptions are sort of agnostic about who these decisions are meant to benefit. So what we care about, again, on um, the right-hand side, sorry, the left-hand side, is where the variation happens. And along the top, what we're worried about is what it is that motivates the differences in the decisions. And so as I mentioned, explanations for war are a good opportunity to practice and think about the effect that these assumptions have on theory building and how you might use the theory's assumptions to poke holes in it. Um, because the objective, this is true because the objectives and consequences when we talk about war are kind of straightforward, right? And here's, we've seen this slide before, Immanuel Kant's liberal internationalism um, the theory argues that people vote against wars with other democracies because people are motivated by a cultural understanding of democracy and liberalism and human rights. They think that as long as another country is not aggressive, if they're picking their own leaders, they're choosing their own policy, they should be left alone. They have the right to do so. As a result, we think democracies don't fight each other. And so what we're looking at at this point is a second image cultural theory. I'm going to go back one slide, right? Because what varies in this case is whether a country is a democracy or an autocracy. And what people care about is some sort of cultural value. Now notice that the decision makers are not the countries. The decision makers in this case are the publics, individual voters within the country who are using culture to make a decision about whether or not a war is in their best interest. And where they have democracy, um, you know, these individual voters are going to decide not to go to war as long as that, as long as their partner, as long as the other end of the pair is also a democracy. All right, so for the purposes of the next few readings, we are going to use World War I, the case of World War I, to examine some of the most important theories about why wars start. Uh, let's take a look at some background of the era leading up to this conflict, and that will help, un help you understand why I chose World War I. First thing to notice is that prior to the advent of the European Union, the period directly before the First World War was the most peaceful era in the history of Europe. European interstate organizations and diplomatic arrangements managed conflicts between a group of burgeoning democracies like Britain and France and a group of modern dictatorships like Germany, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Russia. And this was really quite the accomplishment. Um, Europeans at this time were pretty convinced that they'd seen the end of war as a result of this lasting peace. A second thing to note, which is kind of extraordinary when you think about how we view the world today, this was a time of intense trade and migration openness. We talk a lot about globalization today, but this, what this graph shows you is that by most measurements, the world was considerably more globalized in 1910 than it is today, particularly in terms of financial integration and um, international migration. There were a lot more migrants. There was a lot more trading of money back and forth across borders. And the levels of trade openness, the amount of goods and services that flowed back across borders was actually almost as high uh, during the decade of the 1910s than it was in the decade of the 2000s. So it's an area of extraordinary openness. Uh, despite this overall peace, Europe sort of recognized itself as being broken into three systems of alliances. The first, which is um, so I guess I'm talking about them not in the order that they're presented in the map, but the first represented in orange are the central powers. These are the Germanic peoples of Europe, Germanic languages like German, those spoken in the Austro-Hungarian Empire and in the main at the time in Bulgaria. They allied with the Ottoman Empire to create what was known at that time as the central, the central alliance or the central powers. The second major alliance in Europe at the time was a Slavic alliance in Eastern Europe that was anchored by Russia and they had allies like Serbia and Romania and Greece and Montenegro. Um, in addition to that, you had uh, the, Europe, uh, the European Union, the United Kingdom or Great Britain allied with Francophone countries like France and Belgium. Uh, and to some extent, they were allied with the Netherlands, even though they show up as, as neutral on this map. All of these powers saw their alliances as being balanced. So long as Great Britain and Russia sort of had a loose alliance and were willing to confront German expansionism, 
most people in Europe, most leaders in Europe, saw this as a balanced system. And so the give and take in diplomacy had to do with balancing these three spheres, and especially balancing the central German powers against the alliances led by Russia and by the United Kingdom and France. Of these powers, Austro-Hungary was probably the most fragile, followed by the Ottoman Empire. So this is an issue primarily because both of these powers are in this central alliance. Franz Joseph, the leader of Austro-Hungary, had recently lost his only son, so the crown was set to pass to Franz Ferdinand, who is pictured here. But Franz Ferdinand had made the mistake, if you think of it that way, of marrying a woman of low nobility who was ethnically Czech. And this had created a lot of dissension about whether he should inherit the crown of Austro-Hungary when Franz Joseph died. There were also some broad concerns across Europe that the failure of the Austro-Hungarian line, that if the emperor of Austro-Hungary died and left no heir to the throne, this would lead to an imbalance of power in Europe. Uh, the balance of powers in Europe, and to some extent the peace that prevailed in Europe during this time, was dependent upon the fact that the Austro-Hungarian Empire was powerful and stable. Of course, you're probably familiar with the basics of the history from here. On June 28, 1914, Franz Ferdinand and his wife were shot and killed by a Serbian nationalist while they were touring Sarajevo. Despite the fact that Franz Ferdinand was actually shot on Austro-Hungarian soil, and that he was shot by a Serbian nationalist who was actually an enemy of the Serbian government, the Austro-Hungarian Empire made a series of demands on the Serbians for restitution. And this is just a picture of those demands, obviously. Kaiser Wilhelm II, who felt apparently a deep sense of solidarity with the loss of Franz Ferdinand and the pain of Franz Joseph and his family at the loss of their nephew, offered the full support of the German army to the Austro-Hungarian Empire if Serbia failed to comply with Austro-Hungary's demands. So he promised that Germany would go to war with Austro-Hungary against Serbia if Serbia failed to comply with these demands. And this is interesting for a couple of reasons. The first is that in a straight-on war between Austro-Hungary and Serbia, even though Austro-Hungary is deeply in decline, um, the Hungarians would have rolled over the Serbians. These two countries are not nearly... Uh, not nearly equal in terms of power. The second thing that makes this interesting is that Serbia, as you saw a few slides ago, was a, a satellite state or a minor ally of Russia. And so what you have here is uh, Kaiser Wilhelm making a promise that puts him in opposition with his Russian antagonists. So despite the fact that the Austro-Hungarian Empire only gave Serbia 48 hours to comply with their demands, Serbia found a way to make promises that responded to almost all of the demands that Austro-Hungary put on them. The only exception was that Serbia refused to completely demobilize its army, which would have, of course, functionally ended their existence as a country. This is what you're seeing on the slide here is Kaiser Wilhelm's reaction to the Serbian offer. He was elated. He believed that this underlined the strength of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It was a great victory for Franz Joseph's family personally. And he believed that this ought to mitigate the damage that the Serbians had caused to the Austro-Hungarian Empire and, and that his blank check that he had issued to, um, to Austro-Hungary from the German people was probably not going to be cashed. But to Wilhelm's surprise, Austro-Hungary spurned the Serbian attempt and declared war. Uh, however, as Serbia complied with these demands, it was also worried that exactly this sort of thing was going to happen, right? They were concerned that the demands that Austro-Hungary made were so stringent because Austro-Hungary was planning to use this list as a pretext for war. So as a result, Serbia appealed to its Russian allies. They warned the Russians that Austro-Hungary might mobilize against it, and they pled for a sense of Slavic unity, and that Russia would mobilize if Austro-Hungary decided to attack it. In the event of the war, Austro-Hungary mobilized about half of its army, which is far more than enough to defeat the Serbs. And in response, the Russians mobilized. The Russian mobilization toward the border of Austro-Hungary threatened the Germans. The Germans were worried that this Russian uh, 
force would be able to easily sweep through, well, if they swept through Austro-Hungary, would be able to easily move on to Germany. And if they picked off Austro-Hungary and split this central alliance in two, it would be extremely difficult for Germany to withstand uh, an onslaught from the Russians. So the Germans mobilized themselves, and they also feared to leave their western flank open to a counterstrike by Russia's allies, France and the United Kingdom. So the Germans decided to send troops toward Belgium, as well as sending troops toward the German front. Predictably, this led Britain and France to mobilize, and the rest of the history of the war at this point is probably extremely familiar to most of you. The attempt by the Germans to enact what was known as the Schlieffen Plan, um, to create a two-stage quick strike that avoided fighting a two-front war, failed. Germany swept through Belgium, they attempted to take over France, and they got stopped at the border of France at the Maginot Line. Uh, at this point, the Allied and Entente powers, um, Russia and the United Kingdom and France, had formally joined forces at this point in time and were known as the Entente. Um, the Allied and Entente powers dug into these fortified trenches, and the, the battle lines really did not move for a very, very long time. Trench warfare was grueling. It was really gross business. Lots of people got machine gunned or gassed to death as they tried futilely to take the other side's trenches. During this time, the parties to the conflict, the parties to the war, the major powers in Europe, published these debriefing books on what they saw as the primary causes of the war. This is a photo of Germany's white book, which details Germany's case that it was innocent, it was not guilty for starting the war. Serbia published a blue book, there were red books, green books, purple books of other powers, even Belgium published a book, even though they were obviously not at fault for any of this. One thing is sure, the start of World War I is pretty puzzling. Why would you start a war after a period of great relations and interdependence? Things were going really, really well for Europe. There was a lot of prosperity that was being driven by the fact that the Europeans had peacefully split up Africa and were extracting resources. They were trading with one another at rapid rates. They were trading with the growing power in the United States at rapid rates. Why on earth would you risk all of this by going to war? In particular, why would you risk going to war over the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, who was being marginalized as a figure in one of the collapsing regimes in the, central of, in, in the center of Europe? This seems to be a really inadequate reason to sacrifice the peace and prosperity that Europe had been experiencing for the last 50 or 60 years. If it's true that there's some sort of underlying unseen reason for World War I, can we draw any generalizable lessons from it? If what happened at World War I is puzzling, is there a chance that it will happen again? Are there lessons about the start of international conflicts generally that we can draw from this example or risks in the modern age? And what I'd like you to be thinking about, what we'll talk about a little bit more specifically when we're back in class and all together again, is the extent to which these theories seem to apply to the United States and North Korea today. If these theories are right, what do they imply about the relationship between the United States and North Korea? Okay, so we'll start with Stossinger's Why Nations Go to War. The next three readings that we tackle are all going to consider questions about how war starts. They're going to use the rich history of World War I as a case to tackle that. So one thing that you might also take from this next couple of weeks is... Um, just a general knowledge about World War I that might be good for party trivia or something like that, I don't know. It's also worth noting that Stossinger is a historian. So this reading doesn't set up and solve uh, social science puzzles in quite the same way that we're used to, although I'm going to use this lecture to kind of bend it into shape. But for example, Stossinger doesn't bother with a lit review, and he buries the gist of his theory at the end of the reading. So let's start with his theory. Let's, let's give him a pass on having a lit review. We'll talk when we get to Van Avra a little bit more about why having a lit review is important. But let's just start with Stossinger's theory. Overall, Stossinger argues that the personality of individual leaders is really key to understanding why World War I happened. Um, from this, we might extrapolate the lesson that some leaders are more dangerous than others, right? Those sorts of leaders who have an insecure perception of themselves. 
those leaders who have a negative assessment of the character of their adversary or of the country that they plan to go to war with or might go to war with. Um, questions about paranoia of the adversary's intentions. Um, questions about the adversary's rising and falling power or the rising and falling power of the country itself. And whether or not the leader is really capable of empathizing with the counterplayer on the other side. These systems of perception and apathy are pretty abstract, but if you actually read the article, Stossinger applies it succinctly to some of these leaders. You really get a good sense of what Stossinger believes the character of Tsar Nicholas or Wilhelm II were in the run-up to this conflict. This passage is particularly telling. Now, Stossinger characterizes Franz Joseph as being senile. And he characterizes the Kaiser of Germany as being loyal and mercurial. Elsewhere, Stossinger emphasizes that both the Kaiser and Tsar Nicholas are paranoid. They're careless. They're willing to sacrifice the lives of their countrymen and the prosperity of Europe to safeguard their personal honor. And to safeguard their personal honor in a very peculiar way, in the form of the promises that they make to lesser allies. So in other words, these men are not only paranoid about the rise and fall of their own regime, but they feel deeply that the health of their regime is measured by their ability to keep promises to allies that are getting into wars that could be skirmishes on the border of Europe, but instead they decide to centralize those, those conflicts, according to Stossinger. So they care mostly about the survival of the system that brought them to power. Um, you know, this is part of the deep irony of this conflict. As I mentioned, Franz Ferdinand was murdered by a Serbian nationalist who was attempting to overthrow the empire system in Europe. He was hoping to retake Serbia for the Serbs and take it out of the hands of um, some of their Russian, their Russian overlords. And so Russia and Germany and Austro-Hungary were all similarly invested in seeing off these Serbian nationalists, but rather than use this as a call for solidarity for uh, a monarchy system, Austro-Hungary decided to pick a fight with Serbia that drug the rest of Europe into it. And Stossinger argues that this happens, uh, that Austro-Hungary and Russia and the government of Serbia ignore their common cause against nationalist terrorist organizations because they're also insecure and because they're also tied up in the honor of their alliances. Okay, so how do we measure the extent to which these men were paranoid or mercurial? Since there's no case for comparison with other historical periods, how can we tell whether this independent variable caused a change in the dependent variable? In other words, if we look at the variable of the character of these men, how do we populate it? How do we know whether or not these are even-keeled, rational people or whether they're emotional, overly loyal men? And then if we can populate the independent the cells of the independent variable with these values, how can we tell whether the value of the independent variable correlates in predictable ways with whether or not we have war? Um, Stossinger's goal here is to provide us with evidence of the mechanism. He provides thick description, deep understanding of what we think that these men might have been thinking and doing. Um, Stossinger is a historian and doesn't think in terms of independent and dependent variables. So instead of bothering to measure them separately, he presents instances in which they appear to be connected. He presents vignettes that he believes should be persuasive to us that his theory about what happened is correct. Um, for example, Franz Joseph's age and his withdrawal from politics after the murder of Franz Ferdinand are used as evidence um, that he, that he was not interested in politics. In fact, Stossinger even provides us with a vignette about how Franz Joseph's hand started to shake as he was drafting this legislation to go to war with Serbia, which we're meant to take as evidence that Franz Joseph is senile, that he's not paying attention to politics, and that he's too weak as a leader to control outcomes, policy outcomes in his own country. We can take a look at more specific examples of this too. Um, in this case, Stossinger presents evidence from a number of countries that demonstrate that the authoritarians, particularly the Kaiser, Franz Joseph, and Tsar Nicholas, who were really the authors of the war in Stossinger's view, were disinterested in the details of the policy that led to it. In this vignette, Stossinger describes how Tsar Nicholas, 
who initially refused to deploy his troops, was quickly and easily swayed once one of his uh, most trusted advisors cornered him. Similarly, Stossinger presents this narrative evidence that policymakers to whom the autocrats abdicated responsibility were motivated by concerns other than the health of their own nation. In this case, the German general Moltke is cast as being someone who's hungry for victory. The evidence of this, apparently, is, you know, includes things like Moltke's ability to ride a horse, his depression, his religion, all of these things tend to show that Moltke is a, a strange character, someone who maybe shouldn't have been left in charge of the military. And once the Kaiser went off on his cruise in the North Sea and left Moltke in charge, we might almost expect that someone of this type of insecurity, this type of mercurial nature, is going to go about causing a war. Um, the difference between Kaiser Wilhelm's tone in the Willy Nicky telegrams, if you haven't read this reading, I would suggest you go back and at least read the telegrams that, um, that Tsar Nicholas and Kaiser Wilhelm sent to one another. They're known as the Wiki, uh, <laughs> Willy Nicky telegrams. Um, the difference between Kaiser Wilhelm's tone in those telegrams, which is conciliatory, searching for a solution outside of Germany and Russia, going to war with one another, and his private convictions that all of Europe is conspiring to overrun Germany, demonstrates, in Stossinger's view, how Kaiser Wilhelm's paranoia affected his decision making. So again, we see these vignettes. The fact that Kaiser Wilhelm is willing to say that the world is going to be engulfed in war and that all of Europe is conspiring against Germany is meant to suggest to us that Kaiser Wilhelm is not acting rationally. He's instead um, allowing his emotions and his loyalty to this central alliance govern you know, what should be a rational policymaking process. Okay, so what box does this theory fit into? Okay, hopefully most of you answered that this is a first image realist theory. It appears that the decision makers, or at least the autocrats with whom Sausinger spends most of his time, are making these fateful choices because they want the regime that brought them to power to survive. It's equally clear that the variation here is between leaders, right? Stossinger's main thesis is that there are some leaders who are rational and steady and interested in policy, and there are others who abdicate policy-making decisions after they have created some sort of emotional edict for their followers to, to, to follow up on. Um, <clears throat> the difference between a paranoid and feckless leader and a rational, level-headed leader is the difference between war and peace, or at least the difference between declaring war and preferring peace. Uh, of course, in this chapter, we don't see a lot from the responsible leaders, but S's argument, uh, Sausinger's argument implies that France and Britain, who didn't angle for war, had these sorts of leaders. Potentially, one way to criticize this theory is to note that France and Britain are democracies, and none of the leaders that Stossinger treats deeply in this chapter are, are democratic presidents. They're all autocrats. And so it's possible that what's really happening here is that democratic politics constrains leadership types. It, it pressures people to elect um, level-headed rational leaders and to do away with these sorts of uh, passionate, uh, overly loyal men of the type that Stossinger believed causes the, caused the conflict. Okay, so moving on to Van Evra. Van Evra analyzes the same conflict, much of the same data, and comes to a very different conclusion about what caused the war. Van Evra also decides to, um, declines to provide a lit review. And like Stossinger, he only really examines one case. So in this circumstance, let's actually take a look at what problems this sets up, why we might doubt both Stossinger and Van Evra's theory as a result of their research design. I think that there are two problems, and the, the first one should be pretty obvious. If political science attempts to explain variation, it's sort of impossible to avoid the fact that there's no variation here to explain. We only have one case, and that case turns out um, for war. And there's no variation to explain it with either. We just have a circumstance where Van Ever tells us that an offensive cult and a war happen at the same time. 
and therefore we're sort of left to believe that the offensive cult caused the war. Van Ever partly handles this by creating what is essentially a ghost case. The evidence of the offensive cult stacks up most strongly among countries like Germany, Austro-Hungary, and Russia, who Van Ever plainly sees as being the architects of the war. In contrast, the responders to the aggressors, the United Kingdom and France in particular, did not have offensive cults that were nearly as strong. And so Van Evra explains their hesitancy to join the war, the fact that they only joined the war when it seemed impossible to avoid the conclusion that Europe was sliding into a regional conflict uh, because they lacked offensive cults that were as deeply ingrained as were ingrained in the autocracies. But we still aren't sure whether Van Ever controls for other explanations for the war. For example, Stossinger seems to suggest that um, this is all about personality types. And you'll notice that the countries that have the particularly dangerous personality types, according to Stossinger, are the same countries that Van Ever urges us have deeply uh, militaries that are deeply affected by offensive cults. So it's not possible for us to know whether there are other, reading Van Ever by himself, it's not possible for us to know whether there are other independent variables whose patterns might match what we would expect, the variation in, in which might match with the variation in war in the way that we talked about during the, um, during the Methods Week. Okay. This is, I guess, just Stossinger. Okay, so like Stossinger, Van Ever relies on evidence that exposes a direct linkage between the offensive cult and the war. Let's see how his attempt stacks up against Stossinger's. One of the things I'd like you to pay attention to is whether you're more persuaded by the evidence that Van Ever presents or the way that he presents the evidence than you were with Stossinger. <clears throat> All right, starting with the theory. Van Ever's main theory is that military elites in Europe, in the pre-World War I area, had become socialized in an environment in which they believed that offensive capacity could win wars. This is what he refers to as the cult of the offensive. It's this dogmatic belief that offensive power was going to rule conflicts. As a result of this belief, military leaders came to see or believe that quick offensive strikes would decisively end wars, that they would end them quickly. For Van Ever, this belief has five tangible effects that all made the world more dangerous and all made war more likely. The first is aggressive foreign policy. In order to be in the best possible position for a first strike, states sought to maximize the territory and resources that they controlled. This increased the likelihood for war because each state saw that any strategic gain by the other was a threat. If they controlled territory that was mildly strategic or resources that were mildly strategic, it promoted a conflict among the states. Second, militaries favored strategies that included preemptive strikes. The reasoning for this should be obvious, right? If states believe that defense or militaries believe that defense is largely impotent, then they're hypersensitive to moves toward a first strike. The only way that you can counter a first strike is to move even faster. So you put your militaries in position where it's possible to strike with lightning speed and respond to the perception of a threat that someone is attempting a preemptive strike against you with a preemptive strike that is even faster. Hopefully the reason that this is dangerous, um, in theory at least, comes across pretty easily. Third, states were anxious about whether about the fact that their offensive advantage that they gained through all of this strategizing might be eroded in the future. If you think that you're ahead, but your your rival is liable to catch up with you and you may in fact fall behind, you might believe that you need to strike when the iron is hot, rather than falling behind and needing to defend against the attack of a superior power. Vanever also believes that cults of the offensive encourage states to view diplomacy differently than they do when they believe that defensive power is capable. Rather than seeking consensus through negotiation, rather than recognizing the high cost of war and balancing the cost of negotiating and finding cooperative solutions against the cost of war, diplomacy becomes about threats and bluffing and brinksmanship. If you think that the first strike uh, can quickly win, 
then what you do is you just keep your military constantly at the ready and the second that diplomacy fails you hope that you order the first strike. All of these things make a miscalculation that leads to a first strike and therefore war substantially more likely than ever argues. Finally, because first offensive strikes are easier to affect when the other side doesn't know they're coming, when they're secret, um, and thus they can't swing in on their own first strike first, states try to make military moves in greater secrecy. They're moving their troops around without explaining to the other states what are happening, uh, what's happening at the moment. Um, they're trying to make sure that new capacity that they gain in their military is kept a secret. This, of course, tends to make their rivals nervous. Is a first strike coming? What do these troop movements mean? What does this competitive diplomacy mean? How do I read in the tea leaves the, the intentions of my rival? Because I need to be the first to strike. You know, what's Belgium doing over there right now? Do I need to understand what's happening? Now recall that in Van Evers' theory, the cult of the offensive, um, that belief is the independent variable. So we ask what the value of that independent variable is. You might conceive of this as being a yes or no question. Is there a cult of the offensive in this particular country or not? Or you might see this variable as being continuous. In some countries, the belief in a cult of the offensive is relatively low, where other countries, the military is very, very convinced that the offensive is likely to carry the day. So if we think that the cult of the offensive variable can take two values, yes or no, um, then according to Van Everett, if the value of the independent variable is yes, then we see states more likely to engage in the sorts of behaviors that fall on in the list here. These behaviors in turn lead states to view each other suspiciously and raise the risk that we're going to see a war. Okay, so we can imagine that we're looking for sets of relationships here. A correlation between the belief in the cult of the offensive and the sorts of behaviors that are in the list and a relationship between the behaviors that appear in the list and a later incidence of war. So let's take a look at each, uh, each set of relationships in turn. First, the independent variable. We ask whether there's a cult-like worship of offensive capacity. How might we go about measuring this? Van Ever does it by providing a number of direct quotes from the memoirs of military officials and from the war and policy plans that they were drafting contemporaneously. Here's a set of examples of statements from German military professionals who argue that the superiority of offensive warfare is greater than it was formerly, or that offense is the only way of ensuring victory. We see similar statements in France and in Britain and Russia. Even Belgium seemed to believe in offensive, in offensive capacity. Belgium is obviously an extremely minor power at this point, still today, but they seem to believe that they would get some advantage from attacking first. These beliefs appear to have led at least German officials to make concrete predictions about the speed of the war itself. Read that quote. In two weeks we shall defeat France, then we shall turn around, defeat Russia, and then we shall march to the Balkans and establish order there. That's a really, really glib assessment of how a major European war is going to go, and Van Ever argues that it happens because these people believe that a a quick first strike was the most potent way to end a conflict. It's really, really hard to overstate how horribly, comically, tragically wrong this view was. The vast majority of battle deaths in World War I occurred as wave after wave of these cannon fodder troops climbed out of the trench and got mowed down by fortified machine guns. Those that survived long enough usually got stuck in the barbed wire on the opposite bunker and then got bayoneted to death or were killed with nerve gas. These guys were extremely vulnerable. The trenches rarely moved. World War I was such a defensive war that a huge portion of the casualties that accrued to each side died because they sat in muddy trenches. They, they died or lost limbs to things like trench foot and, and other diseases that happen in these, in these muddy trenches. Okay, so did the belief in the cult of the offensive seem to produce the predicted behaviors, and do these behaviors lead to war? Germany appears to have adopted policies consistent with Van Ever's expectations. They worried about carving up Africa, 
They worried about having colonial possessions. Uh, they worried about confronting other European powers to make sure that they had the right sorts of strategic territory and resources in order to effect a first strike. Russia appears to be in the same situation. Notice that in the underlined portion here, Russian policy is referring specifically to the Balkans, which is the region where the war actually breaks out. Second, we should see evidence that the aggressor states favored preemptive strikes. They favored a policy of preemptive strikes when they drafted up military plans. And in fact, defense was so disrespected that it, it was considered that a matter of days would make the difference between who won and lost the war as long as one side attacked first. We see this in Germany as well. The Russians were concerned that they wouldn't even be able to detect a German or Austrian mobilization. They believed that it was so clearly possible for an offensive campaign to take them by surprise um, that they, they created their entire military strategy around being able to strike first rather than bother to think about how they would repel um, a preemptive strike if they were the victim of one. The Germans were concerned they wouldn't be able to detect a Russian mobilization. So this is a symmetrical relationship. Both the Germans and the Russians believed that their rivals could mobilize on their borders uh, relatively quickly without being detected. The French believed the same thing. Now, of course, notice, um, notice what this means about Vannevar's last element, right? Like this underscores the reason that these countries seem to be obsessed with secrecy. And in fact, at the, at the outset of the war, these countries tried to keep their first strikes a secret. They went to great lengths to make sure, each of them went to great lengths to make sure that these preemptive strikes were somehow secret. Uh, when it's, it's not entirely clear that this is a particularly good strategy. Everyone knows where the troops are going to end up. You all end up, you all know that you're going to end up clashing in certain places in Europe. Okay, we should also see evidence that aggressor states worried about windows of opportunity, that they were concerned about the fact that their own power might be peaking and that the power of their rivals was going to rise and, and overtake them. Germany worried that Russia was going to overtake it. They thought they might be better off attacking uh, before Russia gained enough power to take Germany on. Perhaps we can attack Russia in such a way that we can knock back their development. We can make sure that they're incapable of, of threatening Germany in the near future. Austro-Hungary explicitly argued the same thing. Let's strike while the iron is hot. Our situation will become more precarious as time goes on. We can talk about these other two, um, these other two elements of the cult of the offensive, but like, let's not. We've already sort of talked through secrecy anyway, and if you're interested in this sort of thing, Van Ever lays out a case that competitive diplomacy and a focus on secrecy occurred separately of these things. Okay, so as a first exercise, let's ask about where we would put Van Ever's theory. What do you guys think? Okay, I think this one is substantially trickier. Um, Oh, actually, I put that totally in the wrong box. Perfect. I will correct this before I post the slides. Um, we're talking about differences in military institutions in each country. So this is plainly a second image theory, not a third image theory, as is shown on the slide. I apologize for that. Um, the reason that it's a second image theory, again, is that what we care about is whether military institutions in each individual country are socialized into believing that the offensive, um, that offensive capacity is likely to win wars. I think, I think because Van Ever focuses on the culture of the military, I'd argue that this is a sociological model. But the reason that the military cares about getting the offense-defense difference right, of course, is because they want their state and their military to survive. So I'd absolutely accept an argument that this theory is about realism. There's sort of a realist assumption in the background. And from there, Van Ever focuses on the way in which military leaders in different countries construct a view of what types of strategies are going to be effective. Okay, so who do you find more persuasive? I think the, the, 
mental exercise that I would like you guys to do as we close out this presentation is to ask yourselves how different the evidence that Van Evera and Stossinger rely on really is. It, it appears that in some sense, Stossinger is just arguing that the leaders, the military elite and the autocrats in the eastern part of Europe were paranoid. They were paranoid. They were worried about their, their, um, their alliances for irrational reasons. It was all about honor and loyalty and their ability to preserve this autocratic regime that they had set up for themselves in Eastern Europe, where Van Evera wrestles with the eventual irrationality of the war in a different way. He argues that far from being individually irrational, these elites were brainwashed to some extent or another by this offensive cult. And the mere fact that the offensive cult existed and that other countries believed that it was true actually meant that the world was a more dangerous place. Russia was more likely to strike at Kaiser Wilhelm preemptively because Russia was worried that losing the offensive momentum would mean that Germany would have the opportunity to strike them instead. If, if you are Kaiser Wilhelm and you know that this is what Russia is thinking, is it paranoid? Is it irrational to think that what you need to be doing is preparing your country for war against Russia? Is it irrational to think that you might want to strike while the iron is hot? Is it irrational to look at the war between Austro-Hungary and Serbia as likely to be contained? Or is Russia going to take that opportunity to engage in an offensive war that they can win against Germany as opposed to waiting around. Um, you know, of course, on the flip side, you know, why Stossinger might argue would anyone bother to believe the cult of the offensive? You know, where did this come from? Why were these people so convinced of a military strategy and a military reality that turned out to be so completely wrong? Could it be that the evidence we have that these men believed in a cult of the offensive comes from their irrationality, comes from the fact that they as autocrats viewed themselves as being involved in a system of honor between all of these autocratic men, and that obedience to the rules of that autocratic honor was important to maintaining the system and, and making sure that they survived. Okay, good luck on your midterm. Um, I forgot to mention that at the top of the hour. Uh, make sure to take your midterm, and I look forward to seeing you guys next week.